Hello, my name is Rick and I'm from the Central California Small Business Development Center. And today we're presenting Funding Your Business Without Banks, Credit Cards, or GoFundMe. I want to give a special thank you to our program sponsors, which is the U.S. Small Business Administration and the State of California, the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. Our program is funded in part by cooperative agreements with these two organizations. So all opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed herein are those of us and do not necessarily reflect the views of the state of California or the SBA. Uh, just a little bit of Zoom etiquette. Uh, we have a small group here, so you're welcome to ask questions at any time please submit the questions using the Q&A. Um, please don't be anonymous, so this way I can ask to unmute you and let you ask your question uh, directly to Jenny. Um, use the chat only to communicate with the panelists. Use the Q&A for questions. If you're having some technical difficulties, that's when you use the, uh, the chat. And, uh, Again, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's missing from the bottom of my screen. Um, there we go. This is what it'll look like. Chat, you can raise your hand if you have something to say, and then you can do uh, q and A is where you ask your questions. And with that, I am going to uh, stop sharing so Jenny can share her presentation. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Jenny uh, Kasson who's an expert in the field of funding. And she's, uh, I believe you're an attorney, are you not? I am. She, she, she's an attorney and she's gonna share some wonderful insights with us. So Jenny, take it away. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, I'll just share that I, um, I've been working in the field of helping small businesses raise money since 2006. And I kind of fell into it. I didn't know I would be doing that kind of work when I got out of law school. When I first got out of law school, I was actually at a nonprofit organization. But I happened to find out that there are some really amazing tools available to help businesses raise money. And they are pretty complicated from a legal perspective. They have a lot of legal baggage surrounding them. So, um, because of that, a lot of people are not familiar with them and are not aware that, that what the options are for them to raise money. So I'm on a mission to spread the word about some ways of thinking about raising money for your business that you may not really be familiar with, but I've been helping people do it since 2006. And um, I'm going to share my story real quick about how I actually did it myself. So let's see, how do I forward this slide? There we go. So um, so back in 2006, I had joined this law firm. I, uh, I had met a lawyer that I really liked, and we decided to get together and um, form this law firm to focus on helping entrepreneurs raise money within the law. Um, and I was, you know, just working away at the law firm. And then in 2007, my business partner got the opportunity to go do a different job across the country. And he was like, I'm going to leave you to run this law firm. So all of a sudden, I had never been in a position like that. I had never thought of myself as someone who would run my own business. Um, and all of a sudden, I was a CEO of this company and I had employees. These are some of my employees and um, we, you know, were doing okay, but, you know, we were struggling a lot. Like every month it would be like, oh, are we going to make enough money to like make it through the month? Um, so, and I was this new CEO and I knew nothing about how to run a business. <laughs> so I was just completely overwhelmed. Every month just seemed to like you know, be this catch 22 where it was like, oh, we got to work really hard to get more business, but we don't have quite enough business to cover all our expenses. So we got to work harder, but we can't really afford to hire the people we need to help us be successful. So um, I realized that um, I had been helping my clients raise money for their businesses. And I was like, hmm, maybe we could raise money for our business so we could get a little cushion 
to cover these expenses that would make, you know, spend some money on some things that could make our business more successful. So, you know, we were in that hamster wheel, but then the turning point came when we finally realized we could raise money ourselves. So we did go ahead and raise money and we used a lot of the money for marketing materials and support staff. And it was really, really, really helpful. So not only have I been helping entrepreneurs raise money for their businesses since 2006, I also have raised money for my own businesses. And I've actually now done it many times. That was the first time we raised 150,000. And then we raised another 50,000 for that business, the law firm business. Um, and then I've had other businesses since then that I've raised money for. I think I've raised money like five times now. So, um, so I've learned uh, that sometimes it's really important to raise money. <laughs> Uh, so we have this thing called bootstrap trap. Um, so bootstrapping is when you, and by the way, feel free to jump in and ask a question at any time. I'm happy to be interrupted and, and interact if you have a question or comment at any time. Um, so bootstrapping is when you try to use your own resources to grow your business. And that could be maybe just the money that's coming in from your customers. It could be um, maybe a credit card. <laughs> it could be um, maybe you mortgage your house, put a second mortgage on your house to try to cover the expenses of your business. It can also be trying to cut expenses and cut corners to try to save money because you can't afford to run your business the way you want to and the way that would be really healthy. And so we call this, the, it's often a trap to try to bootstrap because in many, many cases, there are things that you need to do in your business that cost money. And if you're gonna do them well, they might cost a significant amount of money. And if you don't get, and that you just cannot find that money from these other sources. You have to bring in some source of money that is going to allow you to have the cushion, to have the space, to hire good people, to grow your business in a healthy way, because otherwise you can be on that hamster wheel where your business is never quite achieving the success that it has the potential to achieve because you just can't afford those things that would make it a healthy business. So, yeah, so, you know, it, it, I think bootstrapping can be a, really a top reason for business failure. There's so many businesses that think like, oh, if I could just get one more customer, you know, but you don't really have the resources to serve your customers well. And so even if you get a customer, they might not be very happy. Um, so it's just this very, very bad trap that you can get into. And um, many businesses have failed because of it. And I use this, uh, I show a picture of um, Hint Waters founder, Kara Golden. She's someone I admire a lot. Um, and she, uh, when she started her business, she wanted her product to be like the best in every way, the highest quality and have the best company in terms of like the customers, getting, you know, being treated really well and the workers being treated really well so they wouldn't have high turnover. And so she raised money for her business um, right at the very beginning. And she actually didn't break even. I don't think she broke even and became a profitable business for 11 years. Um, and that is because that's not a bad thing. You know, some people might say like, oh, what's wrong with her? How could she go 11 years without being profitable? But for her, it wasn't a bad thing. She did it on purpose because she was trying to build a really healthy company. So that might be an extreme example. But for many, many businesses, you need a few years of upfront investment to be able to build that healthy business that's going to be successful over the long run. So bootstrapping can be a major problem. I'm sure we can all agree to that. Um, and my belief is that the solution to that is raising money from investors. But how? 
a lot of people, when they hear the idea of raising money from investors, it just doesn't feel like something that maybe is possible for them. So I hear when I talk to people about like, have you thought about raising money from investors? I hear a lot of reasons why people are nervous about it or it doesn't feel right for them. So one is they might be afraid of losing control of their business. They might have heard that a lot of bad things can happen. It can be expensive money. If you take that money, what does it mean? What sacrifices are you going to have to make? What, what changes are you going to have to make? Are you going to have to not be your own boss anymore because your investor becomes your boss? Um, I've heard investors don't invest in women and people of color. You know, So why should I even bother? They only invest in white men from who went to MIT. Um, or who would invest in my business? I don't have the type of business that anyone would invest in. I don't have like that high growth tech startup, which remember the first time I raised money, it was for a law firm. So I didn't have a high growth tech startup either. Um, I'm not ready. There's too much I have to do, too much I have to worry about. I don't know how to do it. And what if I lose my investors money? what'll happen? They'll hate me forever and I'll feel so terrible. <laughs> so these are some of the top answers I hear when I ask people if they've thought about raising money and why they haven't. And I just want to really encourage folks to, to try to get beyond some of these myths and some of these beliefs and just really learn about what it can look like to raise money for a business. Because I honestly believe, because I've done it myself and I've done it for dozens and dozens and dozens of businesses, I honestly believe it's possible for just about any business. So there's a three-step process that I recommend you go through if you are going to raise money. And so the first part is what I'm going to really focus on because creating your plan is the most important part. When you have a clear plan and you know how you're going to, you know, get things done and you know what's required, the rest actually becomes fairly easy. Um, so I won't focus too much on the second and third step. The second step is there is some legal work that has to be done. So that's kind of a little bit of a bad news piece is that, yes, you do need a lawyer if you're going to raise money from investors, although, you know, there's many kind of easier ways that don't take a ton of legal work. Um, but you, when you're raising money from investors, it's a highly regulated activity. So once you've created your plan, you will need a lawyer to help you implement the plan. And then of course, once the lawyer has done the legal work, then you can go out and actually raise the money. But what we're gonna talk about right now is the plan because when I tell you about creating your plan for raising money, you'll get a better sense of like what I'm even talking about. What does this look like? So, um, so when it comes to raising money from investors, um, there's a lot of investors out there. Um, a lot of people have a certain image of what an investor is, but I want to encourage you to carefully choose between two possible paths and not assume that your, your typical kind of stereotypical investor is the type of investor that you're necessarily going to be looking for. So choose a path. So I, you know, I didn't used to make a big, huge distinction between this, but over the years, I've really come to feel like there's, there really is a, a choice between two very distinct paths. Um, and one of them I like a lot more than the other. <laughs> I'm very biased because it's the path that I've always taken to raise money and my clients take. Um, so there's these two worlds of startup financing. So what are they? So one of those worlds we could call venture capital. And it's, many people have heard of venture capital. Many people don't really know what it is. So I'm gonna try to explain a little bit about what is that venture capital world. So um, venture capital is a type of investing in small businesses that um, is, uh, has a very, very cookie cutter approach and a very pre-ordained uh, pre definition of what is success. And the way the venture capital path usually works 
is when you first start out, you start looking for investors that may be called angel investors. And the angel investors are part of the venture capital ecosystem. Most, um, if you look around, you'll notice there are these angel groups out there all over the country, there's angel groups. There's a national association of angel investing groups and really all over the country, they exist. And they're kind of designed to be the first step in your path towards raising venture capital. Venture capital, so the, the angel investors invest in your business with the expectation that you will then raise money from venture capital. And, and then they will all kind of join to, you know, the angel, the early angel investors and the venture capitalists will join together in funding your company. And you'll keep going and raising money quite frequently because the model of venture capital is the high growth model. So the, the, the definition of success in the venture capital world is that you start a company that it's usually gonna be a high tech company because this can't really, it's not even possible to do this really outside of high tech. You have to grow exponentially very quickly. You have to be able to take over a large market very, very quickly because venture capital success happens when you are able to take over such a large chunk of the market you know, you can think about examples like Uber, Lyft, WeWork, Facebook, um, you know, businesses that just grew fast at any cost. <laughs> and they were willing to do just about everything to grow and they were their growth, their rapid growth was fueled by venture capital. Now, sadly, when you research, how do I fund my business? A lot of what you find on the internet is a stuff about venture capital. And so you kind of get this idea of like, oh, that's how you fund a business. That's how you raise money from investors. But you have to understand only 0.1% of companies actually raise money from venture capital. So unless you're on that very high growth path where you're looking to dominate a market and then you know probably sell your business to another larger business or do an IPO, like they would like to see you do that within five to seven years. If that's you, then venture capital could be the right path. But if that's not you, which if you're 99.9% .9 of businesses, that's not you, just forget about the venture capital pathway and ecosystem because it's just not going to be a good fit for you. You're going to waste a lot of time if you try to pursue that type of funding. So I have this other type of uh, pathway slash ecosystem that I love that I've been working with since, you know, I started doing this work. And I I don't really, I call it, sometimes I call it we capital because it's like we see instead of VC. So, but basically we capital is everyone else, everyone who is not part of that venture capital ecosystem. So it could be your customers, it could be your suppliers, it could be activists that support the mission of your business. It could be your neighbors and friends. Basically, um, anyone really can be an investor. And those investors that are part of that we capital, they may not even call, you know, they might not even think of themselves as investors, most of them don't. But they don't have those same expectations that venture capitalists have, and they have, they're willing to be open to a much broader definition of success. So um, when I, I wrote a book, it came out three years ago, it's still pretty, um, relevant. I recommend checking it out if you want to dive into the details of how to prepare to raise money. But I did a calculation um, to figure out what percentage of the investors in our country are professional investors. And by professional investors, I mean venture capitalists, active angel investors, you know, anyone who is a, is a professional investor who spends their time on a regular basis thinking about making investments. And only 0.3% of the adult population of our country is professional investors. The rest of the investors in our country 
are non-professional investors, meaning potential we capital type investors who are open-minded people who don't really think of themselves as investors, but have various amounts of money available to invest. And these are people who are already investing. I'm talking about Basically, it's like half of the adult population who already has investments. They mo their investments are mostly um, in the public markets, like through their retirement accounts, but they could become your investors. So, uh, uh, Jenny, uh, yeah. if I could chime in, uh, first question is, uh, what's the name of your book? Mm. Raise Capital on Your Own Terms, How to Fund Your Business Without Selling Your Soul. Okay, wonderful. I just want to add that, um, you know, I'm a former business owner and I'd say most of the financing I got, I've, I've raised over uh, $6 million for my businesses in my lifetime. Most of it has been from private investors and not from traditional lenders. So if you have any questions about experiences, I'd be glad to share some as well. Awesome. <clears throat> see my for some reason my flashlight turned on very weird anyway okay <clears throat> so this slide this is something i found a while ago and i don't know if people are familiar um people who come from different cultures have heard of some of these terms the susu i find a lot of people have heard of but basically as we evolved as a species we created mutual uh, support uh, organizations. And basically whenever someone in a community wanted to get something done, like build a building, start a business, whatever, they would turn to that group. So a SUSU, for example, is, is a common thing, I think in West Africa. Um, I don't have to admit, I don't know the details, but basically it, it exists all over the world. These mutual aid groups that get together contribute money to make things happen. So that's how human beings have been funding ventures for many hundreds and hundreds of years, millennia probably. Um, and so really that is the norm, reaching out to your community, your customers, your fans, your supporters to support your venture is, that's what's been going on for many millennia. This newer model of venture capital, it's very recent. It just got invented in the 50s. So there's nothing set in stone about it. So if you decide that's not for me, don't feel bad because it's it's just one way. It's not right for everyone. Um, so when you live on the we capital planet, you have an infinite number of options. You can structure how you raise funding however you want. You can come up with all kinds of creative structures of how investors get paid. They don't have to be paid based on that exit thing where you have to sell your, you know, grow really fast and then sell your company. There's many ways for investors to get paid and you can design that to fit your goals and values. And you stay in charge of your business. You do not have to give up any control if you don't want to. Your investors generally are going to value your mission as much as financial return. So they're going to be supportive of you caring about more than just giving them the maximum amount of money. They're going to want, they like the fact that your business also does good in the world. Um, diverse founders are getting funded in, by some measures more so than white men. Um, if you look at some of the data, uh, the the huge disparity in who gets funded that exists in the world of venture capital, which you may have heard of, which is truly appalling. Um, that disparity actually doesn't exist in this type of funding. Pe all kinds of folks are getting funded. And it's a fit for 99.9% .9 of businesses, or maybe you could even say 100% of businesses. So my biggest advice is don't try to straddle both worlds, just pick a side and go with it. I have, I've had clients kind of say, yeah, I want to raise money from my community and my customers and my fans, but I'm also going to go to all these venture capital pitch competitions. <laughs> and they end up kind of wasting time because you just have to pick which one is right for you because they're very different. So I'll give you a few examples of some of my clients. Um, Kube Nice Cream 
is a wonderful Oakland-based business that makes uh, dairy-free ice cream. They raised 105,000 about um, from their community. And what they offered was revenue-based debt, which is something where um, it's, it's like a loan, but it's a very flexible loan. So they pay back over time based on their revenues. So they take a percentage of their revenues and pay, um, pay their investors. And then once their investors get paid back a certain amount, the relationship is over. Um, Community Foods Market was one of my very first clients. They're also based in Oakland. They were a brand new startup, a grocery store, and um, they ended up, they worked very, very hard, but they raised over 1.7 million um, and they were able to open their store. They offered equity. So an equity investment means an ownership interest in the company, but the way their equity works is that it pays an annual dividend. So um, with, Venture capital, when you do an equity investment, you're just hoping for that company to sell so that your equity increases in value. But in the case of this business, they just pay an annual payment to their investors. So the investors don't really care if the company ever sells or not. In fact, the company has no intention of selling. Um, and they didn't give away any voting rights. So the, the founders maintain control of the business. Uh, Recompose is a business they've actually now raised, I think they've actually raised now 7 million. And I love this example. This is a woman based in Seattle who invented a new way of handling death care for humans. Um, it's a very beautiful, eco-friendly, family-friendly process. And um, she, when she first Started, her whole idea wasn't even legal in any state, but she was able to raise, I think she raised 700,000 in her first round and she used that to hire a lobbyist. So now what she's doing is now legal in Washington state. And um, that she's gone on to raise about 7 million and they're actually opening their first facilities now. And again, it's non-voting preferred stock, no, um, and she didn't have to give up any control. So those are just a few examples. I can always talk about others. Um, but the next step in the process is, um, sorry, um, is choosing what you want to offer to your investors. You know, like I said, you want to really customize it to your particular situation. A lot of people try to use off the shelf um, documents. And I don't recommend that because um, you want to, the relationship with your investors is governed by these documents and it, it, it can be a very long-term relationship. So you want to make sure it's a healthy relationship that really reflects your goals and values for the business. So, you have a question? so Jenny, yeah. we have another question here, and I think this is a good time to chime in with this one, because I think it, it falls back to the previous slide and what you're talking about now. When you have investors, do you pay them a percentage each month? Uh, you know, you can decide. That's a good question for right now because we're talking about right now. You decide what you want to offer. So mm -hmm. most of my clients, they'll, we design the offering together. So usually what we end up designing is something that has an annual payment, not monthly because monthly can be a hassle. <laughs> um, every now and then I'll have a client who wants to make a quarterly payment, but um, that's completely up to you. Okay, and then in, in the case of, you know, and uh, you obviously don't have to go into details, but on that one that's revenue-based, um, that's usually quarterly, correct? Or is that monthly? Most of my clients do annually. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. It's up to you to decide that. And that's obviously easier because you have to close out your books to figure out like, what did we actually make, you know? So yeah, it's um, annually is usually the best choice. You know, some people worry that investors might not like that because it's not very frequent. But then again, I mean, there's a lot of investments where you don't see a dime for years. So just making an annual payment to investors that can make them quite happy. Thank you. 
So when you're choosing what to offer to investors, you want to just make sure that there's a line, you know, you set it up in such a way so that you create alignment between your goals and values and your investors goals and values. And then of course you also just want it to be doable. So you want to, you don't want to over promise. Um, you want to offer something to investors that seems realistic given your projections. Now, does that mean that you're always going to be able to meet your goals to your, with your investors? No. I mean, it's so common that our projections end up being a little bit overinflated from reality, but that's fine because the way you set it up, you know, it just would slow it down a little bit or, you know, take a little bit longer for the investors to start getting paid, but they're, they have a clear path to getting paid and they know that you're working hard to make sure you're doing your best so that they will get paid. It's completely fine if you don't you know, end up meeting the expectations because the way, you know, investments, the way they generally work, they're not guarantees. They're, um, they're, they're hopeful uh, agreements, <laughs> but it, you know, they're, it, it, depending on how it's structured, you know, if you're not able to make a payment, it's okay. You just, you know, keep working until you can. And then another one, the other big piece of where the lawyer piece comes in is choosing a compliance strategy. So this is where we do have to talk about the fact that raising money from investors is a regulated activity. And as I was mentioning at the beginning, like because it is so highly regulated and there's all these complicated state and federal laws, people can get very intimidated and feel like they just don't even want to go there. In fact, there's even a lot of lawyers, I hate to say, who don't really know the rules. And so they'll just tell your clients like, oh, you know, don't do that. It's too complicated. And you have, there's all this compliance. It's too hard, you know, but honestly, the rules are not that hard to understand. It took me a while, but I finally did understand them. And there are many, many options available for offering investment opportunities to investors within the law without breaking the law. Um, so I'll just, I won't go through all the details on that, but I'll just mention that. Um, is there a, like, Anything anyone wants to break in on at this point? Yeah, this is one of the big questions because I know there were some rule changes from my days of, of needing to raise money. And one of the things I learned early from an attorney, um, because we were talking about strategies, is like, you, you just can't, like, I, I needed to find an investor. And he's like, you just can't put an ad in the paper. Um, was, it, was it Regulation D, I think it was called uh, back then? But there's been some changes to that with uh, the, with the crowdfunding. So maybe you can explain that, uh, the Cliff Notes version of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's getting a little bit more complicated as time goes on because there have been some recent changes which are good, they added more options. So, well, let me just, I'm gonna go through my the piece on this and then we can see if there's a, more questions. So, so, one piece of the compliance puzzle is there's something defined under federal law called an accredited investor. Um, and this is a person who has at least a million dollars in net worth, excluding their primary residence or 200,000 in annual income, or it could be 300,000 with a spouse. But basically it's, a, it's, it's somewhere around maybe 7% of the population um, of the US who meet this this definition and under the law someone who's an accredited investor it's a little bit easier to make an offering of an investment opportunity to them because many of the rules give you know provide exemptions or you know say oh as long as you're only talking to accredited investors you don't have to do xyz filing or whatever so some lawyers will tell you, oh, you can't raise money except from accredited investors. And that is absolutely not true. There's many, many ways to raise money from unaccredited investors. But it is good to be familiar with the concept because there's different rules that have different um, requirements related to accredited and unaccredited investors. So that's one concept. Um, but basically, there, there's almost an infinite number of possibilities. But what you need to decide is, 
do you want to publicly advertise the fact that you're raising money? So you just alluded to this. Uh, can you put an ad in the paper? Um, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. It just depends which compliance strategy you're using. So I love Ben and Jerry's. I, I don't know if people know, but back in 1984, when they were first starting out, they publicly raised money from everyone in the state of Vermont. They publicly advertised, they had events, they put it in the newspaper, they told everyone. And there was a legal compliance strategy that they were able to use to do that, um, which is still available today. That it, it's a, it was a state registration, basically. Um, so they only raised money from Vermont residents. They were very successful and you know became a very success, successful company over the years. Um, but so one question you'll want to ask yourself, do I want to be able to publicly advertise the fact that I'm raising money? Because if I don't, then it is a little harder to reach investors. You have to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. You have to like make, you know, one-on-one -on -one phone calls or emails. You can't be going to public events and announcing, hey, I'm raising money. So that's, I love being able to publicly advertise. In fact, I'm currently raising money for something right now and I'm doing it in a way that allows me to publicly advertise. So I can tell you right now, hey, I have an investment opportunity in this fund called Opportunity Main Street. If you'd like to hear more about it, give me a call. That was legal what I just did <laughs> because of the choice I made about the fundraising strategy I'm using. Um, another one is, do you want to limit yourself only to accredited investors or do you want to be able to include everybody? Um, that's another choice that needs to be made that will affect your compliance strategy that you choose. Um, obviously, it's great when you can include everybody. And um, there's many, many ways to do that. So it's not true if someone tells you you can't. The only thing to be aware of is that sometimes you may be limited in the number of unaccredited investors. So for example, in California, and these are state by state things, um, but in California, there's a way to raise money that's fairly easy from a compliance perspective that allows you to raise from an unlimited number of accredited investors and up to 35 unaccredited investors. So that's just one example of an option that's available. And then how much? Um, the good news is the numbers have been going up. They use, there's this one way of raising money that allows you to include both accredited and unaccredited investors that used to be capped at a million. They raised the cap to 5 million and now they just recently raised it again to 10 million. Um, so, but generally speaking, the more you're raising, potentially the fewer options you'll have in terms of compliance strategy. Um, they actually, with crowdfunding, so the, the crowdfunding law um, passed in 2012, right? Yeah, but it didn't go into effect until 2016. And under that law, you were allowed to raise up to a million but then they increased it to 1,070,000 <laughs> for inflation. And then more recently, they've actually just increased it to 5 million. So these numbers are going up. And then what state? So um, many of the rules governing compliance are state level rules. So if you wanna be able to raise money in multiple states, there could be more complication, more compliance things you have to deal with. Whereas if you wanna just raise money in one state or two states, it could be a little bit easier. Although I will say there are some federal rules that preempt state law. So the federal crowdfunding rules actually preempt state law. So one of the beautiful things about the new crowdfunding law, relatively new, is that you can raise in all 50 states without having to do state by state compliance. So yeah, and you know this this just shows um, I submitted the petition that actually led to the passage of the Jobs Act, which is what made federal crowdfunding legal. So I'm super proud of that. Um, let's see. That's me. That's the back of my head watching President Obama sign the Jobs Act. 
And who's getting funded? We're, as I said before, we are seeing women and people of color getting funded actually at a higher rate than white men with crowdfunding. So that's really good news. I actually co-founded an investment crowdfunding platform called Crowdfund Main Street, which you can check out. We do have an offering up there right now you might wanna check out. Um, let's see. Are there any other questions about the compliance piece? I'm not seeing any questions yet. Okay. Okay. So I'll just mention one other thing. Um, Angels of Main Street, this is a little off topic, but I'll just mention that I started this other group called Angels of Main Street which is a place where you can go if you wanna learn more about being an investor. So, you know, most of my work is helping entrepreneurs raise money, but I also love to build the whole ecosystem. So we have this group called Angels of Main Street and it's open to anyone regardless of wealth or income. If you wanna start dipping a toe into making these kinds of investments and doing it as part of a group, which is more fun than trying to do it on your own. Um, so anyway, so that so we just went through that whole step one, which was the planning process. Um, and then once you've created your plan, so you know, um, you know what you're going to offer, you know what legal compliance strategy you're going to use, then you can have your lawyer draft the actual investment instrument and also do the required securities filings to make sure you're totally in compliance when you're going out there and offering the investment opportunity. And you don't wanna offer the investment opportunity until you're sure you're in compliance with the state and federal law. And then raise, it's so easy at that point. <laughs> All right, I think that's it for my slides. So, so Jenny, one of the questions I have for you, if you can go into a little bit more detail about the difference between an equity structure deal and a debt financing structure deal. Sure. Yeah. So the two main choices of what you can offer to investors is equity and debt. And they are quite different, although you will see, sometimes you'll see some types of debt that look a bit equity-like and you'll see some types of equity that look kind of debt-like, but they are very different. And it's important to keep the distinction clear because the IRS treats them very differently. So your accountant needs to know if what you're offering is equity or debt. I'll admit the first time I raised money, I created something that it wasn't clear whether it was equity or debt. And my accountant got really upset with me. <laughs> I had to rewrite it and redo it to make it clear that it was debt. Um, but basically, so let me describe what each one is. So equity is an ownership interest in a company. So if you start a business like a form a corporation or a limited liability company, or you know, any kind of entity, you can sell ownership interests in that company. And it's a really cool trick. You know, it, it, I think the first company to ever do that was back in the 1600s. Uh, the, uh, what is it? The British East India, whatever. I don't know, but that idea, it's like a cool idea. You can have many, many thousands of people owning a piece of this company. And um, that's what we own when we invest in the stock market is a piece of stock, a, a share of stock in a company. And a stock represents a small fractional ownership interest in that company. And when those stocks are on the public markets, we can buy and sell and trade those stocks. But in a private company, you know, you're just, you may end up having like 10 or 20 or 15 investors who own a piece of the company. And what does it really mean to own a piece of a company? There's all kinds of different things that might go along with that. It's not set in stone. So for example, you might sell 10 shares of stock in your company. That doesn't necessarily mean that the person who owns those 10 shares of stock has any voting rights. That's really up to you to determine. Sometimes shares of stock do have voting rights and owners of stock have the right to elect the board. 
but they don't have to. That's up to you to structure. Sometimes you might own a share of stock that might give you the right to collect dividends on a regular basis, but that's just totally up to the company to decide. Um, the main rights that you do have as a shareholder that are written into the law are you have certain information rights, so you can demand that the company share certain information with you, like an annual report. Um, you know, you have certain rights as an owner, but they're pretty minimal. It depends, you know, unless they're specifically chosen to be written into the agreement with the company. And um, the one thing that you can say though, is that you own a, it's like you own a piece of property that has some value. So you're buying a piece of stock that has some price associated with it. And the price you pay for it is the value when you buy it. And you may be, one way that you can make money off of owning stock is the value of that stock goes up. So for example, if the company were to sell themselves to another company and that company bought all the stock in that company, they'd buy it maybe for a higher price than what you bought it for. And you would have the right to those residual, the, res the, the increase in value of that stock. So that's equity. And really with, you might say equity is a more risky type of investment than debt because equity always gets paid last. So if you have a company where there it's entered into a bunch of agreements where it has a bunch of obligations to pay for different things and it maybe it has a loan from a bank, the creditors of the company always get paid first. So if you have a company that gets very deep into debt and you own equity in that company, you might find yourself with not a lot of value left over because the company like goes out of business because they just have to pay off all their creditors and there's nothing left over. Debt, on the other hand, um, gets paid for equity. So if I make a debt investment in a company, my rights are superior to those of who, who own equity. What debt is, is just simply a promise to pay back a certain amount. And you can get quite creative with debt. So the debt can be revenue-based where the payment is based on what was your annual revenue, what was your annual you know, gross receipts or net profits or whatever you wanna do. Um, the payback can be a set amount or it can be a, a, an un, a, a variable amount depending on the length of time. And that's where debt can get quite creative and almost look like equity because it's it's not like a bank loan. It's a it's something where you're you're still taking a risk as an investor. You don't know if you're going to get paid. You know, if you're if the company says we're going to pay you 10% of our profits every year and the company never makes a profit, you're not going to get paid. <laughs> right. Um, one of the things I did want to bring up about this though cuz I you know, I've, I've always learned, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, that equity investment's 100% at risk. There's no guarantee that it's based on the performance of the investment, how the company does, whereas debt financing is an obligation. There is a promise to pay. It could be flexible. There could be all sorts of terms, but it, it, it's not open-ended. There is an obligation, and if for some reason the business doesn't work, depending how the promissory note is written, you still have the obligation to pay. And usually it, it involves either a bankruptcy or some sort of default process. If, exactly, if okay. exactly. There's one little kind of wrinkle to that with equity and that's something called um, cumulative dividends. And that's where, and this, the company that's currently raising money on my um, crowdfund Main Street website, they offer cumulative dividends. And what that means is that they pay an annual dividend. So I'm entitled, as an investor, I'm entitled to a dividend. Now, what if they have a really bad year and they can't afford to pay a dividend? It's actually illegal for them to pay a dividend if, if they can't make their, their creditors whole and you know stay solvent and stay up on their current obligations, it would be illegal for to pay me that dividend. However, because it's a cumulative dividend, it accumulates, it accrues. So I actually, next time they have enough money, they have to pay that to me. So that it's almost debt-like. 
but still the, the big difference is that you cannot really be in default because like you said, if, you know, the obligation is only to the extent that it's possible to make the payment without putting the company at risk with respect to its creditors. Okay, and we're still open to questions, but I'm going to I'm going to ask one more. Um, finding great investors and I'm, I'm prepared to share my story on, on how I found investors, but what are your thoughts on finding great investors. Well, I really want to hear your story, so I'll make mine quick. I just would say, you know, keep a really open mind and just think about people who are passionate about the same things you are. Often it's going to be your customers that the same pool of people who would be your customers could be your could end up being your investors. But yeah, let's hear your story. <laughs> so, so my business was a bagel store, ah! a bagel store, and um, I love I bagels. <laughs> <laughs> I got approved for a $50,000 loan, um, wrote my business plan and was all ready to go, went to close on my loan, actually already started buying some equipment and the banker wouldn't close on my loan. It was a different banker. They fired the banker that approved my loan and he outright told me we fired the banker because we didn't think this was a good deal. Uh, I, I'm showing him my approval letter and he's like, well, uh, you're no longer approved. So I had to find money quick. So there, there's a saying we, we use at SBDC called FFF, which is friends, family, and fools. So I went to every family member I had that I knew might have $50,000, got turned down, went to every friend I know, and I, I was young at the time, so I didn't have many friends with $50,000, and they said no. So I found a fool. It was, uh, turns out it was my ex-wife's boss. And he was just a, a wealthy businessman. I knew he was a multimillionaire. And I asked him if he'd be interested in looking at my business plan. I gave him my business plan at 11 o'clock in the morning. At one o'clock in the afternoon, I had a, a $50,000 check. Yay, I love and, it. But, but, you know, it was kind of what you said earlier is, um, I, I didn't have a good attorney like Jenny and uh, didn't understand the difference between, and it was an equity deal. So he bought 15% of my company for $50,000, but he made me pay him $2,000 a month, no matter what. And wow. I, didn't, I didn't understand that. I didn't know I could have just not paid that if I wanted <laughs> and uh, got my first tax return. And uh, I remember I, I, I had to use his accountant and his accountant said, you owe $7,000 in taxes. And I'm like, well, I have no money in my bank. How can I owe $7,000 in taxes? And he goes, you made $24,000 in profit. And I'm like, <laughs> if I made $24,000 in profit, how come it's not in the bank? And it wasn't until I did some reading that I found out that that money I was paying him, I considered that an expense, a business expense. Right, and but I it was, came out of profit. Right, and I was just paying him 100% of my profits. And, oh my God. And it was a lesson learned, you know, I, I, was, I was a young businessman and, and, and I was shocked. And um, so I eventually bought him out and it was funny, you know, I, Looking back, I paid this investor on his fifty thousand dollars. He made one hundred twenty-three thousand oh, dollars. Good for him. <laughs> <laughs> and, Who was the fool? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you know, from another standpoint, what I tell people is, you know, if if I knew what I know now, you know, my business did make you know twenty-four thousand dollars a profit. And that first year, and that was my very first year. Absolutely. And if you think about that, you know, on $50,000 investment, you know, even if I just gave him half of that in the first year, you know, he would have been making, you know, 20% return on investment. And I did get to the point where 15% would have been $10,000 a year. Um, and, it, you know, our business was making that much profit. And that's a fantastic return on investment. So when you talk about what are you looking for in an investor, I always tell people, give them a return on investment. The average person, you talked about these accredited investors that have lots of wealth and they're investing their money in the stock market. 
average annual rate of return on those investments tends to be about 7%. It's just kind of that general rule of thumb. If you're a deep, you know, some people do better. You know, there's always that story of, you know, I bought Amazon at $10 and now it's worth $1,000. That's rare. Most people are making seven, maybe 10% on that. And a lot of small business owners can offer a much better return Absolutely. on investment. Absolutely. With, without, you know, and I, I love how you said this earlier, without, you know, putting stress on their business. And that's where you can have the flexibility and whether it's debt financing, paying interest only until the business matures a little or equity financing, you know, holding off on dividends and retaining earnings and not making payouts until the business gets a little bit of working capital going. Yeah. And, you know, you do bring up an important point that debt and equity are treated differently from a tax perspective. So if you raise money in the form of debt, it tends to be better for you from a tax perspective because your the interest payments are tax deductible, whereas payouts from equity generally are treated as profit. So it's not deductible. So yeah, that's something to be sure you have a good uh, tax advisor on that. Right. Okay. I, I got a question. Let me uh, ask this one. Would you consider raising money through convertible notes? I've seen a video through Y Combinator saying it was a simpler way during seed fund funding than just trading for company equity for an X dollar amount. Good and question. I actually have experience with this one too. So I'll let you answer first and then I'll share my story on that one. Yes, convertible notes can be a good tool, but you just need to really be aware of what when they are a good tool and when they don't make sense. So the purpose for a convertible note, and by the way, you will hear of something called a safe, which is kind of a variation on a convertible note as well. Um, that's what Y Combinator really promotes, but I'll just talk about convertible notes to keep it simple. Um, the reason you would use a convertible note is because you would like to sell equity in your company, but you're just not quite ready. Um, and the reasons for that could be you just want to save some money on the legal fees because uh, doing a convertible note is much simpler than doing equity an equity offering. Um, it could be because you want to wait a year or two to be able to make the argument that the value of your equity could be higher. So in that case, a convertible note can make a lot of sense. Sometimes, though, the problem that happens is people will use a convertible note without any real plan for what's going to happen will it ever convert and how will it convert and what will make it convert? And then you end up with just this convertible note that is basically just a loan that has to be paid back. And there's different ways to structure convertible notes. So like, I can't say convertible notes are good or convertible notes are bad because the way you structure it has to be very tailored to your particular situation. So in, in our particular interest, and, and I will say that I'm not very well schooled on this, we, we raised $3 million in, in uh, convertible notes from a company and it was very socially based. So that the investors that invested uh, were, you know, um, they believed in our social mission and what our company was doing. And we were a for-profit company. We received the convertible notes and, uh, you know, and, and we actually uh, went to our second round of funding and received funding three months before COVID hit, um, which, you know, totally changed uh, what happens. And one of the things that I, I kind of brought up to, to the team, you know, to, to our friends there was, well, this doesn't look like it's going to convert right now with with what's happening, it, you know, it really doesn't look like we're going to go to equity on this. So what are the terms? And I felt it wasn't written very well. So in your experience, have, have you seen notes where it's very clear that, okay, if, if this doesn't convert to equity, this is what the debt terms are going to be? Yeah, I mean, there's different ways to do it. You could just say, uh, I mean, one of the things is the length of the term, you know, like, because some pe people often set the term really short, like, uh, you know, 
a, a year and a half or two years. And that's a short time to have that conversion happen because that goes by really fast and you have to get your equity raise all in place to be able to make it convert. Because what usually causes the conversion is you raise a certain amount in equity. Mm -hmm. So one thing is just to keep the term a bit longer. I, I try to keep it at five years. Um, so you have a little more wiggle room there. And then in the meantime, you know, they're, the investors are accruing interest. So they're fine, you know. Um, but the other thing that you can do, can you hold on? I just want to ask someone to turn on the light. I got an opportunity to get the light turned on. <laughs> um, I didn't realize how dark it would get on the call. Um, but the other thing is you can also um, have provisions in the note about what happens if the maturity comes and you haven't raised that equity round. Right. So different things can happen. It could just be that, oh, we owe you the money. We have to pay you back. It could be we get um, a one-year extension option. It could be that the note automatically converts into common stock at a pre-decided valuation. Right. So, so we had a follow-up question about what a convertible note is. So I'm going to take a stab at this, and then Jenny's going to correct me as she she is apt to do very well. Um, so a convertible note is basically. Uh, so let's use my three million dollar example. We raised three million dollars. We're hoping to to get a, a group of equity investors. And let's just say to make this work totally, we're going to raise another three million dollars. And once we raise that $3 million, what we do is we create a valuation of the company. And the first people that raised the 3 million that we had the convertible note with, basically once the valuation is in, it goes from being a loan to they now own shares of the company. And it could be something as basic as now it's a $6 million company, they own 50% of shares in the company, or the company might, some cases, the company gains in value because, you know, in, in our particular case, we got a big contract with a, a national um, clothing manufacturer. And once we close, you know, just having that contract uh, with this company, it made us look like, hey, we're going someplace. So they might say, okay, the company's valued at 10 million. So then that 3 million would be worth 30% um, of that. So that's how it would work. And often what happens is those people who came in early as a bonus for coming in early, they also get some discount on the price. So often it's like a 20% discount. Um, or another thing that you'll sometimes see is a valuation cap where they can invest at a no more, like let's say they invest 3 million, they're, you know, the convertible note holders invest 3 million and you say, okay, once we raise another 3 million in equity, you're gonna convert. If we raise the 3 million in equity at any more than a $20 million valuation, you get the valuation cap of 20 million. So that keeps them from being, they get a bigger chunk of equity because of that. Right. But at the same point, if we don't raise that extra money, then it, it, it's now a loan. And like Jenny talked about, interest is accruing at it. And eventually, you have to start making payments on that okay. loan. Now, you know, in all the reading I've done on this, which I did a lot of reading on it, is most people that invest in these convertible notes are pretty much recognizing that there's a good chance they'll never get paid back. If, even if it does convert to a, an obligation and, and a debt deal, there's just not going to be enough money to pay it back. Yeah, it's definitely high risk, you know, but I mean, well, that's why Y Combinator invented this thing called the safe, because the, the convertible note is a loan. So you do owe money. So like when the, when the loan matures, if it does, if it hasn't converted at that time, you have to pay it back, generally speaking, depending on what's written in the contract. Um, and that can be a very challenging time for the entrepreneur because they probably can't pay it back, which means they have to go and beg their investors. Can we just extend for a year? You know, give me one more year to raise the equity. But 
Y Combinator invented this thing called a SAFE, which stands for Simple Agreement for Future Equity, which is almost identical to a convertible note, except it's not a note. All it is is a contract that gives the investor the right to buy equity in the future if the company does raise an equity round. So that completely, that is a really high risk investment for the investor, but it's right. happening because, a lot in Silicon Valley because they're making big bets and they're willing to take big bets. Right, and, and like you talked about earlier, usually that comes at a premium, which is they get a much better discount on, on the valuation, correct? You know, not necessarily. They'll mm -hmm. usually get a, like what will usually happen is they'll get the, the better deal of a 20% discount or some valuation cap. Okay. So, and, yeah. Yeah, and to, to the person who asked the question, if we didn't ask that well enough, please feel free to ask a follow-up question on that one. I will say for, for most of the smaller businesses, you know, and I'm going to kind of use under a million dollars of needing funding for your business. A convertible note is probably less of an option than a general equity investment with a small group in having something like that. Um, one of the stories that, um, you know, I, I used to live in Alaska of, of all the places I live, very similar to Ben and Jerry's is Alaskan Brewing Company and the story of how they raised money. And they basically had a community meeting and they offered people the chance to in, invest in their brewing company. And I, I think, uh, you know, a good portion of Juno invested, Juno Alaska invested in Alaskan Brewing Company. And it was kind of interesting because uh, they went through a second stage where a lot of people just weren't happy with it and just wrote it off. And they, they did a second investment and people sold their shares to kind of collect their losses. And then that's when things just broke open and Alaskan Brewing Company just became huge. Wow. I, I used to live next door to Jeff and Marcy Larson, and, they, and they're just some of the greatest people. It's just such a fantastic story. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, it's so rewarding to invest directly in a business. When you think about where your money is invested, if you have a retirement account, you're not investing in any productive activity in the economy. You're just buying stock from someone else who owned it before you. But when you can invest in an actual company, you're contributing to their success, their, you know, growing jobs and wealth. And, and then often it's fun too, because you get to be, you know, you get special perks, you get to be invited to special events. And so, yeah, I just, I highly recommend, you know, even if you just invest a small amount, like trying it out. And the best place to start with that is use it is through investment crowdfunding because that's like the easiest way to find those opportunities. Right. And we're going to have to wrap this up soon, but I just want to ask uh, in, in kind of a leading question for you because um, you talked about um, not giving up control. And, and I understand a lot of businesses don't want to give up control and want to run the businesses they the way they do, but what are the limits to not giving up control? You know, I take that really far. I, I'm, I feel really strongly. I love my clients. I think they're really smart. I don't want them to have to give up control. Actually, my husband uh, worked for a company that um, took on some VC investors and the VC investors came in with all their brilliance and all their wonderful insights. And basically within a few months, the company was out of business. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm not a big believer that some some investor is going to come along and like be this white knight who's going to like know all the answers that you don't know. I, I have a lot of faith in entrepreneurs that they do know a lot and they can get help too. There's no, I mean, I want you to get help. That's why I want you to raise money so you can hire the best, you know, hire me, hire other consultants who can be your best, best, best advisors. And you can fill in the gaps where you aren't as knowledgeable or experienced, but I'm not a huge fan of giving investors control. I just, I, I've heard too many horror stories of investors who may, who are, don't know what they're doing and think they're super smart and destroy right. the company. And in my commentary on that, and I'm the same way, it's like, you know, I, I want to 
run my businesses the way I want to run my businesses. And even though I have a partner, you know, I want to be the majority partner and do things those way, uh, that way. But uh, there is the, the term fiduciary responsibility, which is to treat your company like a company. And you, you have to think of what's in the best interest of the company, which may not always be in the best interest of yourself. So. True. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, I, I don't work with any business. I work with business owners who are highly um, mission driven, who are highly have high integrity. They want to do what's right. You know, and I use my gut instinct to tell me when I, when someone is that, you know, so, but I, you know, I honestly believe most entrepreneurs are out to not just make money, but do good in the world, build wealth, build jobs, build something beautiful in the world. And, and they should be able to do that unconstrained. Of course, the law does, you know, constrain you and you just want to stay within the law. And yeah, obviously think of your investors as major stakeholders that need to be well taken care of and keeping in, kept in the loop. I have some clients that aren't so good about communicating with their investors and we don't like to see that. You want to keep them in the loop and make sure they know what's going on. Okay. Well, Jenny, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Uh, Magali, uh, really quick, if you could put into the chat the link to register for counseling at the Small Business Development Center. If anybody has any follow-up questions or wants to meet with one of our consultants, uh, we offer counseling at no cost. And someone just asked, when will the recording be available? It'll probably be available tomorrow. And you'll get a follow-up email because you were in on this class. So everybody that registered for the class will get a link to watch this video on demand. Okay. And Thank Holly, you. thanks for uh, putting in the sign up. That's where you can sign up and reach out to us. Thank you so much, Jenny, and look forward to the next class we do. Same. Thank you. Bye. Bye.